One of the most common things that I hear from my students is how difficult it is to play Sally Gooden like Earl Scruggs or J.D. Crow. And if you don't know already, the version that I'm talking about sounds something like this. Sally Gooden is a great tune, and it's a great way to get into some of the up-the-neck playing that people want to play in the style of Earl Scruggs. But it's just more difficult to play than other things that Earl played up-the-neck, like, say, Cumberland Gap. So why would that be? Well, let's get into all of that, but first I just want to let you know that if you want the tablature for Sally Gooden and everything else in this lesson, and everything in all of my lessons, then you should head to patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. That's where I post all the tablature and bonus practice tips and live streams, all sorts of things that you can't find here on YouTube. And if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and like this video. That makes a huge difference for people who make their living making videos like these. Anyway, the first complaint that I usually get about this tune is how physically uncomfortable it is just to get your hands in the right position to play this tune. And that's true, it is challenging, but there's something else going on here. A lot of people come to this tune relatively early on in their progress on the banjo. And it's either because they've heard the Foggy Mountain Banjo album, or maybe it's just because they want to learn some up-the-neck material. But the reality is that this tune, compared to other beginner tunes, is actually much more difficult because it doesn't use any of the positions that those beginner tunes use. If you think about other tunes like Cripple Creek or Fireball Mail, they don't actually require that your left hand does much more than, say, slides or hammer-ons or pull-offs. You don't spend a lot of time in a chord position moving individual fingers around. And that doesn't mean that those tunes are easy to play, it just means that when you struggle with them, it's usually not because you can't reach some of the notes. Contrast that with Sally Gooden, which has a deceptively non-repetitive right-hand pattern and a difficult stretch in the left hand. But I'm not saying that you shouldn't learn this tune. You definitely should. There's a lot of material in this tune that you can use for other up-the-neck tunes or for backup up-the-neck. I just think it's worth considering that when you come across something like this that's different from everything else that you've looked at, it actually makes a lot of sense that it's going to be more difficult and more frustrating and actually more physically demanding. And all of that is to say that patience is key. But now let's talk specifics. Here's some concrete things that you can do to make that stretch in the left hand a little easier. It starts by not trying so hard to stretch your little finger to reach the 11th fret. You are going to have to accurately move your little finger in ways that you probably haven't before, but there are a lot of things that we can do with the position of our hands and our wrist that are actually going to make that stretch a little easier. So there are three basic options when it comes to the position of our wrist. Wrist extension can be comfortable and stable, but limits our dexterity and reach, so that's probably not the right answer for this situation. The opposite, wrist flexion, can make it a lot easier to reach our target notes, but unfortunately it's a lot less stable and it's actually a little bit dangerous. You can really hurt yourself if you spend much time playing with your wrist in this position. As it turns out, the best option is to have some sort of balance between stability and reach, which means keeping a relatively straight wrist. But that's not all we have to do. If you look at this image of Earl Scruggs playing up the neck, you can see that his thumb extends above the fretboard. That can help you give your wrist just the right angle to be able to reach all the notes that you need to hit while still being able to actually apply pressure to the strings. And this might not be exactly what works for you, but this is probably a good place to start so you can find what does work for you. You should be willing to adjust your hand and your wrist to be able to reach the notes that you want to reach, and one of the best ways to do that is to observe and analyze what other players do. And Earl Scruggs is a pretty good place to start with that. Just remember not to put your hands at risk by stretching too far or playing with a lot of tension. Now let's talk about the actual form of the tune. If you recall the version that I played at the beginning of this video, you may or may not have noticed that it was not in the same order as what Earl plays on the Foggy Mountain Banjo album. The way I played it was in the AABB form, meaning I played the A section twice and then the B section twice, and then I did it all over again. And I played the first time through all up the neck, and then I played the second time through all down the neck. That's pretty common for what you would hear for a lot of fiddle tunes, but that's not what Earl does. On the Foggy Mountain Banjo recording, he plays the A section twice up the neck, and the B section twice up the neck, then the A section twice up the neck, and then the B section twice down the neck. And then he plays the A section again twice down the neck, but doesn't play any B sections. He effectively plays two and a half times through the tune before the fiddle comes back in. Then for his second break, he starts with the B sections down the neck and then plays the A and B sections up the neck. 
playing through the whole tune one and a half times, starting halfway through the tune. So aside from all the technical challenges of this tune, I wouldn't be surprised if you were confused by this particular arrangement of Sally Gooden. And I see players all the time who play just what Earl played on the recording, in a jam session or on stage. And then when they get to the end of what Earl played, there's a moment of awkward silence when nobody knows when to come in because actually the banjo player has ended his break halfway through the tune. And sometimes if you get lucky, everyone knows which version that you're playing, but it really is a fiddle tune, so sometimes it's hard to expect that the banjo player is gonna dictate how the tune goes. But here's what I think is the most confusing thing about Sally Gooden on the Foggy Mountain Banjo album. If you go back and listen to it, then I hope you notice the first time through the tune, the bass is off by half a measure for the entire first time through the tune. Go back and listen to it. The rhythm section comes in half a measure later than you might expect them to, and then the bass is off by half a measure for the entire first time through the tune. And it does eventually correct itself for most of the recording, but if that's the version that you know, then you're probably most familiar with the sound of Earl playing the tune with the rhythm section off by half a measure, which would really make it feel like different sections start at different times. And this has created a lot of confusion. Some people think there are extra beats in the version that Earl Scruggs did, or some people think that certain sections start a half a measure earlier or later. But the reality is, as far as the form of the song is concerned, Earl doesn't play anything out of the ordinary. He plays A sections and B sections exactly as long as any fiddle player would. And I know for myself, when I first learned this tune, I found it really confusing that every time I thought the bass player was supposed to be landing on G, the root note, he was landing on D. And every time he was supposed to be landing on D, he was landing on G. And it totally flips the entire tune around until later in the recording. So it's possible that you could get a clearer image in your mind of what this song really sounds like if you go listen to another version. Like, for instance, the version that J.D. Crow plays. He's basically playing it just the way that Earl did. It's just the rhythm section is actually playing along with what he's playing. And if you're playing alone, then it's kind of just your problem. You're just going to be a little confused about when certain sections start but technically you could just play all the right notes in the right order and you'd be playing Sally Gooden. But if you play with a fiddle player or a band, then there's a good chance that this confusion is gonna set you half a measure off from where they are. And this time, it's not the band's fault, it's gonna be your fault. So let's clear all of that up and talk about what's actually contained within each section, where they begin and end. Here's the full A section. And here's the full B section. Now let's talk about some of the challenges you'll find in each section. First, with the A sections, you might have noticed that the first half is nearly identical to the second half, with one major difference. The first time through, we start on the note B, and the second time through, we start on the note G. And you might not think it, but this can be one of the most difficult things about this tune. Sometimes the most subtle differences from one section to another can be the most difficult things to remember and master. And here's how you might want to think about this. The first time through the A section, we're going to play middle, thumb, index, middle. And the second time through, we're going to play index, middle, thumb, middle also known as the first half of the Foggy Mountain Breakdown Rule. You don't necessarily need to play it this way. You could just pick the first time through or the second time through and repeat it twice for your A sections. But this is where a lot of people struggle to maintain their speed and timing. So it's actually a really good opportunity to work on your technique. And let's also talk about the Foggy Mountain Breakdown Rule because that can also make this tune a lot easier. Some people play the first half of this roll as index middle, index middle instead of index middle, thumb middle, as Earl and many others do it. And that's probably fine if that's comfortable for you, but in this tune, you play index middle on the second and first strings over and over again. So by the time you have to repeat them back to back, up to speed, it can be really difficult to maintain that speed and also keep good timing. But that's kind of confusing too, because in theory, playing index middle on both of those strings should make more sense. You don't have to bring your thumb all the way up to the second string. And I've seen plenty of videos of J.D. Crow playing this tune and repeating index middle for the Foggy Mountain Breakdown roll. But for some people, like me apparently, it makes a world of difference to use the thumb during the Foggy Mountain Breakdown roll, especially in this tune. I used to play in a band that would play Sally Gooden at every show. And we'd start the tune off with just banjo and fiddle, and then the rest of the band would come in, and then I'd take my break. 
and the intro sounded pretty good, and when the band came in, it sounded pretty good, and the beginning of my break sounded pretty good, but by the time we got to the second half of the A section, where I had to do that Foggy Mountain Breakdown roll, and I used Index Middle, Index Middle, I would always mess it up. And I practiced this tune a lot, slowly with a metronome, gradually increasing speed, all the stuff that you're supposed to do. And I even could play it on my own, up to speed, without making mistakes. But in the heat of the moment, on stage, in front of people, or in a jam, it's so much more difficult to do things like that if it's not really comfortable. And for some people, maybe it is comfortable, and maybe if I stuck with it, then it would become comfortable. But as soon as I switched to index middle, thumb middle, it just was comfortable. So beside the technical challenges of the A section, it can also be kind of difficult to know where you are in the tune. If you're not familiar with the actual melody of Sally Gooden, then it can all sound really repetitive, and you can get lost in the abyss of all these really similar sounding up the neck licks. But remember that the way that Scruggs style banjo players generally play the melody of Sally Gooden is not the real melody. Scruggs style banjo players tend to approximate the melody of fiddle tunes instead of playing them note for note. So if you've only heard a banjo player play Sally Gooden, then you don't really have a clear picture in your mind of what the melody is. So I suggest you go listen to fiddle players playing Sally Gooden over and over again until you have a really clear picture in your mind of what the tune sounds like, almost as clear as you can remember Happy Birthday. And then go back and listen to the Scruggs style arrangement of the tune over and over again until you can hear that fiddle melody within the arrangement. Then each variation within this one up the neck position is gonna serve a specific purpose because it's all referencing a specific part of the melody, even if you're not playing each note in the melody. Okay, now let's talk about the B section. Probably the most difficult part about the B section is knowing exactly when it starts and ends. So again, here's the entire B section. Some people think, because of the Foggy Mountain Banjo recording of this tune, that the B section starts here. But actually, it starts here, on a G note. And if it did start here, then there would be extra beats at the end of the last A section, and there would be beats missing from the last B section, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's still just an A-A-B-B -B tune. But here's the thing, you get to choose what part of the tune feels like the beginning of a section, depending on where you put accents. So if you accent heavily that first note G, then eventually it's gonna feel more like that's the beginning of that section. Aside from that specific issue, the B section is really just about getting comfortable with playing up the neck, which really just takes patience, playing slowly and deliberately. And then luckily the down the neck version that most people play of this tune is pretty similar to other things that you would play down the neck in the Scruggs style. So we don't really have too much to talk about there. But let's say that you've now learned the tune and you can actually play it up to speed. There's one more challenge that's gonna trip you up even if you do know the tune. And this is an issue that you can run into basically anywhere in bluegrass banjo, but seems especially common in Sally Gooden. And that's that if you make one mistake, it's really difficult to get back on track and find your place again. And for this tune and really anything else, the solution is to have enough material that you can play instead of the melody until you can get back to the melody. And usually that just means playing some sort of placeholder material until you get to the end of the section where you can start over with what you meant to play in the first place. Luckily, there's a lot of material in this style between tunes like Cumberland Gap or Sally Ann or Blackjack or all the up the neck backup that people often play. So your goal is to learn more of this material and then practice using it in place of the melody. So as an example, here's me playing the entire form of the tune without really playing the melody. I'm just playing something that sounds kind of like the melody for the amount of time that the melody happens. Now, if I really wanted to play the melody, I wouldn't use any of that material. But if I got off track, then I could choose from some of those licks to take the place of the melody until the end of the section and then I could jump back in. So say I was playing through the tune and the first A section was fine, but then I made a mistake as I was going into the second A section. Hopefully I could quickly recover and play something that sounds kind of like the melody for the second A section. Then when I get to the B section, I can hopefully jump in with what the actual melody is. And this is not necessarily easy to do. You might have to actually compose four or eight bars of fake melody that you can play instead of the melody and then practice transitioning into the next section. And the more material that you learn in the style, and the more you substitute this lick for this lick, the more likely it is that when you make a mistake, you're gonna have something that you can play until you get back to the next section. 
So if you don't know any of that material, then consider learning some of those tunes like Cumberland Gap or Sally Ann, or take some of the ideas that I just played and apply them in place of the melody during Sally Ann. But be careful because this isn't an excuse to just not play the melody. This is something that you can practice in addition to the melody so that you have some options when you need them or if you want to improvise. Okay, so these ideas might not immediately make this tune easy to play, but I hope it at least illustrates the changes you can make in your technique or the way you look at a tune to make it more manageable. And with this tune, in my case, it took time, a lot of time. I probably messed up this tune on stage 30 or 40 times at bluegrass festivals in front of banjo players that I really didn't want to make mistakes in front of before I started to understand how to play this tune successfully on a regular basis. So you might have to mess up this tune a bunch of times in places where you don't really want to make mistakes, before you actually start getting it the way that you want and finding what works for you. Hope you enjoyed this lesson. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and like this video and check out patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo for all the tablature and a bunch of bonus content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.